Detective Smith perjured himself on the stand in, in explaining how the video came to be in this very compromised uh, situ you know, uh, condition. Um, we should not be in a position of having to prove what is absent from that video. Once we have raised a legitimate question about the authenticity of that video through this forensic analysis, it, it seems clear that the burden should shift to the Commonwealth to rebut that that inference that that, there, that this tape was was deliberately tampered with. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Did, did Ms. Starks identify? Other than on that videotape, did Ms. Starks identify Daryl Jones? I mean, she's your only eyeball witness, right? No. Excuse me if you would no, step outside. Cool. And then when he was holding Brian's jacket, they had got on the sidewalk. And when we got on the sidewalk, I saw a gun. And I said, a gun? Who had, the, who had the gun? The small guy had the gun. Uh -huh. About the man that's singing. The small guy had the gun. Getting photographs of Daryl Diamond Jones. I think the jury should never have seen that videotape. I think it was inherently unreliable. And I think without that videotape that Daryl would have been found not guilty. In a heartbeat. You're going to see where this woman needs a fix. She's clearly, you know, zooted out of her mind, and the tape cuts. Where does the tape cut? It's a crash edit. The tape cuts at the moment when she's saying the little guy had the gun that was put next to the uh, the big guy. Well, there is no little guy and a big guy. Daryl was 18 or 19 years old at the time, I think. He's six feet. Mr. Rodriguez is six one. They're the same size. So. That's when the tape cuts, and it cuts to a, um, an episode of Sergeant Bilko, which is like a, a cop show from the 50s, 60s, whatever it is. There's no way that could have happened by accident, but it all got covered up among many other things that, that constitute a travesty of justice in this case. And there Mr. Thompson is not here. We sent someone over there with a cane to put around his neck to bring him yeah. back. Um, I think you arranged this hearing date with him, didn't you? Yes, so he did. he knows about it? Yes, he does. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, I'm Robert Thompson on behalf of the Commonwealth. Your Honor, if I may uh, apologize for not being here right at 2 o'clock. Uh, I, I don't know what happened, but I didn't receive notice that this hearing was this early. Perfectly fine. All right. Uh, introduce themselves to the court. <laughs> Your Honor, I'm Neil Austin for the defendant, Mr. Jones. Lisa Cavanaugh with the CBCS Answers Program on behalf of Mr. Jones. John J. Carter, also here for Mr. Jones. So there may be additional materials that are on that tape uh, that are relevant to the issues in our motion. For example, if it turned out that uh, Sergeant Bilko was on the rest of the 129 tapes, I think that would certainly be relevant. So we'd like to examine the tape for that purpose. I think the other uh, response, though, is that there are additional forensic clues in the actual VHS tape that aren't available in the digital copy that our expert had uh, at his disposal. So, and, I, and, and that includes physically looking at the tape, uh, uh, looking at the tabs, making a, perhaps a, the, the copy that our expert had, I don't think we actually know whether it was a second generation or a third generation or a fourth generation copy. This we know would be a second generation copy, which from a forensics point of view is much better uh, than having a third or fourth generation copy. Well, I'm not sure we even know that it's a second generation. Um, I mean, we don't know whether the police made a copy before sending it to the DA's office. Do well, my, perhaps Mr. Thompson could address this, but my understanding was that what was in the box of exhibits was what was actually played to the jury. Now, to your point, it's possible that that was itself a copy of, a, of an original. Uh, we don't know that, but, but I think, frankly, that is a material point because one of the issues here is whether or not the, the tape, the original tape, was dubbed onto a second tape, which already had Sergeant Bilko on it. So I think even knowing that would be useful information for our forensic expert. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thompson. Yeah, um, 
I certainly don't have any problem with the court taking back the, the exhibits. I mean, they are essentially part of the court record, and and frankly, uh, I think that the attorney's office would prefer the, the court have its, its possession and custody on the parts of the court record. Um, just for that matter, the the tape. My understanding, you know, from uh, uh, my memory, at least of reading the defendant's motion, was any digital copy was made from. A VHS copy by the defense expert. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Did, did Ms. Starks identify, other than on that videotape, did Ms. Starks identify Daryl Jones? I mean, she's your only eyeball witness, right? No. Excuse me, if you would no, just step outside, please. Okay. Did you read the transcript on that? But who's the other eyeball witness? I'm not going to make any comments. Who's the other eyeball witness? I just want to know. But, but you would agree, but you would agree, if that was a crash edit of that tape, that that would be a material uh, fact, wouldn't it? No. I mean, that would be like a travesty of justice. Well, you heard me, no. So you disagree? Yes. That's fine. All right, thank you very much for the interview. Gonzo journalism, however you want to describe it, it's cool. Chris Cady. Chris Ballporter? I was here. For, yeah, so Tony's met Chris. Uh, Chris is a, he's an attorney, and he's a number of things, he's a filmmaker. Uh, I call him a gonzo journalist, kind of ripping from the Hunter S. Thompson days. Um, that he, he, uh, I don't know, he's like, he's in constant search for the truth. That's, that's a good summary.